Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully, y'all are having a wonderful day today. So this is going to be another video that I'm going to review here that is going to be about another conversation about the alleged pound for pound list. And I thought that I would talk about overall this little subject because the pound for pound list, in my opinion, in all the boxing, that probably is the most debated. It probably is the most heated debated, probably is the most controversial conversation because boxing pound for pound list, probably unlike any other sport, it really is up for the most debate. There really is no confirmation. There's really no voting. I mean, there is voting about who the fighter of the year is, but just because someone is the fighter of the year does not necessarily mean that they're the number one pound for pound fighter of that year. You know, it may be a little bit different from that of the MVP award and that of the NFL or the NHL or MLB baseball, NBA, whatever sport you want to overall go at. So it may be a little bit different, but overall, I thought that this video would be very particularly interesting. And this is going to be a video that I'm going to review by Dante's Boxing Nation. Well, Dante's Boxing Nation, if you've known him overall within you know the past several years, especially within the past few years, ever since that he somewhat started the new media movement for his channel, one of the big overall ranking points overall of his pound for pound system is apparently the ability to take risk or trying to take risks. So that's why you see, at least allegedly, certain fighters like that of a Deontay Wilder or a Demetrius Bubu Andre or a Jamal Charlo sometimes on his top 10 pound per pound list. You know, even though I don't personally believe that those fighters, that any of those fighters deserve to be on a top 10 pound per pound list, never thought that they really did. You know, and all those fighters are very good in their own right. And I do understand the point that Dante is trying to make, but I think that if you're going to make that point, that it's a little bit dangerous. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of that also is allegations. And when you talk about the top 10 pound per pound fighters, there's a lot of fighters on the top 10 pound per pound list to where they didn't necessarily take every opportunity or every fight that was given to them. Does that necessarily mean that they were ducking them? Does that necessarily mean that they were just taking another opportunity that they seemed better? You know, is it really overall, you know, a ducking situation or is it something a little bit different? And are you just alleging that they're ducking that fighter because you don't necessarily like that fighter? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. But at the end of the day, once again, I don't really have a huge problem with Dante at least alleging that this is a big part of his pound for pound ranking system. But really the main reason why he's doing this overall is to put certain fighters that he sees fit on his pound for pound list like that of a Demetrius Bubo Andre or a Jamal Charlo. And the problem that I have overall with certain fighters like that on the pound for pound list is not only do they not have the resume, but even if you're going to allege their alleged ability to take risk, and Dante doesn't really mention either Andre or Jamal Charlo, I believe, in this. I believe he mentions more of Devin Haney and maybe a Shakur Stevens, and I can't necessarily remember. But if you're going to allege certain fighters like that of an Andre or a Jamal Charlo, those are two fighters overall that, in my opinion... Yes, they've been willing to take certain risks in the past, but if you take a look at Jamal Charlo, for example, there's a lot of risks that he's also not been willing to take. He clearly is not interested in either the Demetrius Bubu Andre or David Benavidez fight. He does not also seem interested in that of the David Morrell fight. The only fights that he really seems interested in is the fights that he knows is really going to propel his career to the next level, whether he wins or loses. So there really is no pressure in those situations. And there's really only one or two fights that he's really mainly been interested in. That's been the Gennady Golovkin fight and the Canelo Alvarez fight, which of course is two great fights to aim for. But if you're not willing to fight some of the other top contenders to get there, and if you're still not getting those fights, then in my opinion, you really you really can't call that person someone who's a clear top 10 pound per pound fighter, especially when they clearly don't have the resume because they're allegedly so willing to take on all the risks. And Demetrius Bubo Andre, in my opinion, he's been willing to take more risks than that overall of a Jamal Charlo by far. But there are still certain fights, in my opinion, that he could take that so far I haven't really heard him mention. I didn't really hear him mention Danny Jacobs that he could have potentially fought at the middleweight division. I also didn't hear him still mention David Benavidez. And if he's allegedly overall better, you know, a better pure boxer as Canelo, where all in all, if you apparently put him on that same level, if you truly believe that, then you have to push Demetrius Bubo Andre just as hard to fight David Benavidez as what you're pushing Canelo Alvarez. So it is what it is. Not only that, but if we are going to rank by that system, if we're going to rank by that ranking point, all of a sudden certain things, in my opinion, on the pound for pound list have to change. 
All of a sudden, Terrence Bud Crawford cannot clearly be the number one pound for pound fighter anymore. Now, in my opinion, he never truly was in the first place. But Terrence Bud Crawford and Dante, they, they've been really been trying to sweep this under the rug or put this through rose-colored glasses. And I'm not saying that Terrence Bud Crawford hasn't necessarily ducked anybody. I'm not really going to say that. I just think that Terrence Bud Crawford, what I will say is this. I just think that he could have signed with the PBC a hell of a long time ago. And the reason overall for the potential fallout of the Errol Spence invest or excuse me, the Errol Spence negotiations, it did appear overall to be a little bit more on the side of Terrence Bud Crawford. And on top of that, once again, I thought that he could have potentially fought Danny Garcia, Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, Jordanis Ugas, and some of those other guys. He could have potentially fought all those guys had he signed with the PBC. But Terrence Bud Crawford willingly signed multiple contracts with that of the opposite promotion. Overall, a Bob Aaron promoter who clearly does not like that of Al Heyman or that of the PBC and is very difficult making deals with them. And he resigned with them twice. So at the end of the day, when you talk about allegedly taking risks, that's all really about perspective when it comes to certain things. And when it really comes to Terrence Bud Crawford, who Dante alleges is the number one pound for pound fighter, is he really the person that's willing to take the most risk? Because so far from what I've seen, Terrence Bud Crawford was not willing to sign with the PBC a multitude of times when all the elite big boy welterweights were at the PBC stable. And on top of that, it seems that Terrence Bud Crawford apparently is not happy with the split that he's potentially going to get. Now, I could be wrong about that. Maybe Terrence Bud Crawford, it's possible maybe that he will accept the split that Errol Spence is going to give him. But we'll see what happens. Not only that, but then all of a sudden you have to change certain things on the pound for pound list. Alexander Usyk, even though I still have him in my, in my top five, he clearly overall becomes a front runner as the number one pound for pound fighter, which in my opinion really is conversation worthy anyway. So nothing really changes much there. But all of a sudden, Iowa Inoue, who in my view is not a top five pound for pound fighter because I don't believe that he has the resume, all of a sudden you have to shoot him to the top of the list. All of a sudden, he now debatably becomes the number one pound for pound fighter because Iowa Inoue, <laughs> overall, when it comes to those divisions, I haven't really heard anyone else besides maybe a Gail Morigandau call him out. You know, Roman Chocolate Tito Gonzalez has not been interested in that fight. Juan Francisco Estrada has not seen personally interested in that fight. So all of a sudden, because Niowa Inouye seems somewhat avoided by certain fighters, all of a sudden we have to shoot him to the top of the list. And Dante, of course, would not do that. He claims that he does not even believe that Niowa Inouye is a top 10 pound per pound fighter. Well, why not? Niowa Inouye seems to be willing to take a lot of risks out there. So <laughs> once again, really all this is, is to put certain fighters that he wants on the alleged coincidental list on his top 10 pound per pound list, which once again... I don't really have a huge problem with if you want to rank by that point system if you're consistent. But, you know, we all know that's not going to happen here. But any anyways, I thought that that'd be very particularly interesting. But let's see what Dante has to say. Let's get into it. No more. <laughs> so even from the grave, the greatest Muhammad Ali, he continues to spit game. At least when it comes to spitting game to these fighters, when it comes to taking risk inside the ring and outside of the ring. You have a lot of black fighters that are willing to fight anyone. They're willing to take any kind of risk. Fighters like Devin Haney, fighters like Shakur Stevenson, fighters like Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford, regardless of how negotiations went, you don't negotiate with... Well, let me state this, and I give them a lot of credit, um, but you can't necessarily overall judge Devin Haney and someone like that of a Shakur Stevenson on the same level as what you could overall maybe debate them as with the Terrence Bud Crawford or an Earl Spence or someone like a Canelo or something else like that. Now, some people may say, what are you talking about? Why can't you overall, you know, judge them on the same level? Because both Shakur Stevenson and Devin Haney, they're still up and comers. Now, some people may say, what the hell are you talking about? Shakur Stevenson is a two-way division champion, and he just recently got the biggest win of his career over Oscar Valdez. Yes, but Shakur Stevenson and Devin Haney, because of the lack of overall of these top five pound per pound acclaim, at least somewhat, they're still looking overall to get something out there. You know, <coughs> excuse me, certain fighters all in all, once again, you get to see truly who a person is once they're overall fully in power. You know, once a person overall gets a great amount of acclaim, that's who you get to see who, you know, truly who they are. When Keith one time Thurman, for those of you that remember him, at one point in time, Keith Thurman was avoided by certain fighters overall within that weight division, and apparently he was willing to fight everybody. He was willing to fight Sean Porter. He was willing to fight Danny Garcia. 
All of a sudden, Errol Spence Jr. came around, and all of a sudden, Errol Spence Jr. was the main boogeyman of that weight division. When it came to Gennady Golovkin, at one point in time, Gennady Golovkin was the most avoided middleweight in the world. Okay, he was the most avoided middleweight in the world. He was avoided by Sergio Martinez. Miguel Cotto and Canelo Alvarez, at one point in time, were not even very interested in fighting him. And there's even a couple of others. Peter Quillen, for those of you that remember, he once upon a time was the very big fight for Gennady Golovkin. He blatantly admitted that he did not want to fight Gennady Golovkin. So does that mean that Gennady Golovkin was debatably the number one pound for pound fighter at that point in time? I'm sorry, I just don't know if I can really rank by that. But, you know, it is what it is. Anyway. Someone for five months because you don't want to fight. Now, when you don't want to fight, you may fake negotiate for maybe like one week or something like that, like Mungia did with Charlo. And honestly, I don't even think that reached real negotiation status. So that may not even count. I always tell you guys this. Taking risk in the ring, it's not just about fighting every single person that's calling you out. But it's about... At well, right, but what fighters really in history really fought every single fighter that called them out? You know, and that's the, and, and all the, <laughs> that doesn't always mean that it's necessarily a duck. Now, if you have a fighter that clearly is fighting bum after bum after bum... Or someone on the know that clearly is being protected like that of a Leo Santa Cruz. You know, someone, for those of you that remember, Guillermo Rigondeaux and Gary Russell Jr. and a multitude of other fighters. They were calling him out repeatedly, but he would never fight those guys. <laughs> he would never fight those guys. He only fought guys that he thought that he potentially could beat before, of course, the Javante Tang Davis fight where he was being a little bit more forgotten. And Jav excuse me, Javante Tang Davis, of course, right now is being highly protected as well, as well as Ryan Garcia. But Dante, of course, because he doesn't like certain fighters, like that of Canelo Alvarez, and he doesn't want them to be high on the pound for pound list, he, of course, is going to claim that a certain amount of fighters overall that he hasn't fought yet, that he's quote-unquote avoiding them. And that's not me saying that Canelo overall has not avoided maybe a fight here and there, but the majority of challenges that have been presented to Canelo Alvarez, he's pretty much taken. So I, I can't really take a look at it and say, well, because he hasn't fought David Benavidez yet, and because he hasn't fought Jamal Charlo yet, that I can just overall completely tear down his top pound per pound ranking. I can't do that because Canelo Alvarez has still fought repeated A-grade fighters, certain fighters that are probably just about as dangerous as that of a Jamal Charlo or Demetrius Bobo Andre, and some people may disagree with me, but I think that Caleb Plant, in my opinion, that he's about on that same level, and, so, and some people may disagree. Listen, this is my opinion. I think that if you have an undefeated Caleb Plant and an undefeated Jamal Charlo, I think that the undefeated Caleb Plant pulls out at the end of the day. I don't know if he wins now because I don't know how he's going to be after that Canelo Alvarez loss. Certain fighters are never the same after that. But I believe that Caleb Plant still would have a very decent chance. And Caleb Plant versus Demetrius Bubu Andre also would be a very particularly interesting fight. So it is what it is. That's just my opinion on the matter. Now, David Benavidez, of course, he's overall a little bit more dangerous than any of those fighters, in my opinion, uh, overall for any one of those fighters because not only... Does he have a little bit of skill? But on top of that, he's pretty much a light heavyweight, <laughs> disguised overall as a 168-pounder. Uh, but when it comes down to it, all in all, once again, I can't claim overall just because a fighter maybe has not taken a couple fights, but still are taking very, very decent threats, if not even bigger threats, like what Canelo did with that of a Dimitri Bivol. I can't just claim that that fighter is allegedly not overall willing to take a lot of risks. That just doesn't make any sense. He's fighting the majority of them, if not all of them. But if you now, are... Once again, if you have a fighter like a Leo Santa Cruz or a Jose Ramirez who recently turned down Regis Pro Gray or, you know, someone on the know that clearly is avoiding the most dangerous fighter in that division, then all of a sudden it becomes a problem. ...willing to fight all of them, that just shows your confidence is on a whole nother level. And that's who Devin Haney is today. Listen, we all know this deep down, regardless if you want to admit it or not. Win, lose, or draw, we all know that if it was up to Devin Haney three years ago, he would have already fought Lomachenko, uh, Tank Davis, Ryan Garcia, Teofimo Lopez. We know this for a fact. Do you want to jump off the help desk right into a six-figure cybersecurity career? Or maybe you just got started in IT and realized that you don't... We know this for a fact. And that cannot be said about everyone else in the lightweight division. This is the reason why. I would agree uh, when it comes down to it. And I have certain people that comment on my videos from time to time. And of course, I respect everyone's opinion, at least mostly <laughs> when it comes down to it. 
Uh, but anyways, I have certain people that comment down on my videos sometimes, and they say, well, you know, do you truly believe that Lomachenko and Tiafima Lopez avoided Devin Haney? What I'll say is this. I think that Devin Haney certainly was more interested in those fights than what those two were with that of a Devin Haney. I think it's very clear. It just is what it is when you take a look at Lomachenko. Now, of course, it was acceptable at the time because he was facing Tiafima Lopez, but he was the one, all in all, that did not face his mandatory with that of a Devin Haney. It just is what it is. And then, of course, you have Tiafima Lopez to where a multitude of times, even though he said that maybe he would fight him, he didn't sound very interested. So at the end of the day, I do have to overall come to the, you know, acquisition or overall I have to come to overall, you know, uh, the conclusion that Devin Haney appeared more interested in the fight. At least that's overall what I can see. Uh, but anyway. I taking risk should be another attribute that determines where you should be placed on the pound for pound list. Well, it can be used to a degree. But it has to be used all in all in terms of also having a very decent resume and in terms of also having a great amount of accomplishments. Because if we're also talking about a certain amount of fighters that are willing to take a lot of risks, David Benavidez right now is willing to fight anybody. He said that he's willing to fight Demetrius Bubo Andrade. He's willing to fight Jamal Charlo. He's willing to fight Canelo Alvarez. He's willing to pretty much fight anyone overall in that 168-pound division. Once again, I still have yet to see David Benavidez on Dante's or New Media's top 10 pound per pound list. Where is David Benavidez? I still have yet to see him. I did not see him on last year's pound per pound list. And this has been raging on now for allegedly a couple of years. So what's the deal? A pound per pound. Which once again shows you that Dante's true motivation about this, it really isn't overall to put out a fair and logical objective list. It's to basically put the black American fighters that I want to be on this list. <laughs> but it is what it is list is supposed to be based on dominance resume and skill and now you can add willing well, it has to be based on excuse me in my opinion on resume accomplishments dominance skill set and you can also put in you know overall going into risk if you want to add maybe a fifth element but all those things overall have to be put into the equation but resume is always going to be the most important factor because if you have a person all in all or a boxer, a fighter that clearly has a way better resume than this other fighter, and even if you want to allege that this fighter is so avoided like that of a Demetrius Bubu Andre, my point is this. I've seen a lot of avoided fighters in my time. Usually when there's a fighter that can get even a single fight out there, it's not usually because it's everyone else's fault. It's usually because it's that own fighter's fault. Whether it's because they're making stupid ass decisions with their promotion, like that of a Demetrius Bubu Andrade or Terrence Bud Crawford, or whether overall it's because maybe they did not take certain opportunities overall that they should have. Overall, usually, overall, it's not really everybody else's fault. Because even very highly avoided fighters, like that of an Arasani Laura and a Guillermo El Chacal Rigandao, for those of you that remember those fighters, even they eventually got decently big fights. Even eventually, Arasani Laura got the Canelo Alvarez fight and the Austin Trout fight and the Tourette Hurd fight. He ended up getting those fights, all right? When you talk about Golovkin, he even eventually ended up getting the Canelo Alvarez fight and the Danny Jacobs fights. You know, when you talk about, you know, some other fighters that maybe I'm forgetting at, at the moment, when you talk about overall, you know, uh, I'm trying to think overall, you know, maybe of who else. I had another fighter in mind, but I can't necessarily remember. But even some of the most avoided fighters that I've personally seen, even Earl Spence Jr. at one point in time, very avoided at one point in time at 147. All these fighters eventually end up getting decently big fights. So what is Andre? What is Charlo? What are some of these other fighters not doing? Even Devin Haney recently, who was somewhat avoided at 135, even he was able to get big fights. So how is Demetrius Bubo Andre, who allegedly is the most avoided fighter in the world, at least by some of these accords, you know, how is it that... All in all, once again, that even these fighters that were very, very avoided, that they were even able to get a multitude of big fights. But Demetrius Bubu Andre, he can't even get one fight against the former champion. That doesn't make sense. Take risk. Your confidence <laughs> level. Do you truly believe that you're the best or do you just say it because it sounds good on camera? I've always said when it comes to Canelo Alvarez, if Canelo would have... Of course, the main guy that you love to hate. <laughs> Let's say he would have ducked Andre, but he fought Charlo. I'm talking about like five, six, seven, eight years ago. It wouldn't look that bad for Canelo, right? 
Well, in my opinion, really doesn't look that bad because Canelo Alvarez is fighting guys that are probably along the same lines, at least certain guys that are about on the same threat level. Now, some guys may say, what are you talking about? Caleb Plant really isn't on that level. No, no, actually he is. Because when you take a look at Caleb Plant, Jamal Charlo, and Andre, Caleb Plant actually probably has the best resume out of all of them. <laughs> and, on, and on top of that, his skill set is right there with them. So it just is what it is. That's why I've never really seen it as that big of a deal. Uh, you know, and once again, these guys were claiming that Saunders and Caleb Plant and Callum Smith, that all these guys are very decent fighters. They always claim that certain guys are very, very decent fighters until Canelo, where the guy that they don't like is about to fight them. And all of a sudden they say, oh, he must see a weakness or, oh, this must be going on. So once again, Dante is not to be trusted because just like a regular fanboy, he'll change the standards every single time that it needs to be changed for him overall to be pleased. Today, he decided to fight Benavidez, but he still didn't want to fight Android or vice versa. It would not look as bad. But he doesn't take risks. Right, so instead of overall fighting Benavidez or Demetrius Bubo Andre, he fought an even way bigger threat in Demetrius Bebel. So apparently that's, <laughs> apparently Canelo Alvarez is taking no risk. I got gotcha. you. Unless he's forced to get in the ring with a dangerous opponent like he was when he had to fight Bivol. He didn't have to fight Demetrius Bivol at all. Um, that overall has been a big misleading overall uh, you know, uh, title. Uh, Canelo Alvarez was not forced to fight Demetri Bivol at all. No way. He was never forced to fight Demetri Bivol. And when Canelo Alvarez got in the ring with Demetri Bivol, Dante was now claiming overall at the end, for those of you that remember, that apparently it was a duck or overall that it was a lesser fight than a Jamal Charlo fight because of the quote-unquote European style. So, <laughs> quit your bullshit, Dante. Taking risk, it means... You pick a fighter that was forced to get in the ring with a certain fighter, all in all, is like that overall when Leo Santa Cruz finally overall had to face someone like a Javante Tank Davis because he didn't have any more excuses. He had nowhere else, else to run uh, when it came down to it. A fighter overall that was forced to fight somebody overall, you know, I'm trying to think maybe of another example. Uh, you know, that would basically be <laughs> when, you know, Kell Brook eventually fought Earl Spence Jr., one of those fighters, because any one of those fighters, Charlo, Andre, or Benavidez, those are all risk. And you do it on your own. You do it without someone putting a gun to your head and telling you this is the only way we're going to pay you is if you fight one of these guys that you don't want to fight. And then you end up losing to them. That doesn't count. Now, if you're forced to fight someone and you beat them convincingly, then that's a complete different story. Because we all know for a fact that if Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, Devin Haney, Shakur Stevenson, if they were in Canelo Alvarez's shoes, they would have fought some of, if not all of those guys that Canelo Alvarez has been avoiding for like eight years. Well, once again, would Terrence Bud Crawford really have fought those guys or would he have said the bullshit that he's been saying now for the past several years? about how these guys are allegedly using an excuse about across the street, and if they truly wanted to fight me, they could fight me. Or are you really just truly hiding behind those politics? No offense against Terrence Bud Crawford, but he's been on that bullshit now for the past several years. You know damn well that Bob Arum overall is a huge roadblock in terms of the negotiations for the PBC. Why the hell would you resign with them for years upon years upon years? And he's still somewhat with them. I mean, I believe his last fight overall was on black TV or whatever the hell it was. But a lot of his fights are still on top rank. So it's like, you know, whatever the hell Terrence Bud Crawford is doing, you know, allegedly he's willing to take all this risk. Really, all Terrence Bud Crawford has been doing is talking a lot of shit, you know, and really overall he hasn't really taken any action. It just is what it is. Here's now, and I can guarantee you, when it comes to David Benavidez... Most of them would be fighting to get David Benavidez first. Remember, I'm talking about evolving. Really? So it's going to be very interesting once again to see if Demetrius Bobo Andre and Jamal Charlo overall goes after David Benavidez once again because they seem to be pretty quiet about facing David Benavidez. Well, these guys were naturally fighting in the same weight class. I'm not talking about guys at smaller weight classes moving up. Now, going back to the pound for pound list, this is the reason why. There are a lot of factors that determine if you're truly pound for pound the best or one of the best. For example, you can't... Well, there's a multitude of factors. There's really not a lot of factors. Once again, my pound for pound list is based off of about four or five categories. Uh, the most important category, I don't care what anybody says, it has to be resume. 
and then of course accomplishments dominance and skill set okay or skill set and dominance you know it has to be in my opinion in that order and then maybe you can talk about you know their willingness to take all the fights you know then you can talk about that if you want to but that probably is the weakest point in my opinion because once again there's just certain fights that at times get pushed to the side because maybe the fighter believes that there's better opportunities or that there's better history along the lines. Like, in my opinion, when Canelo was trying to unify 175. Have, quote-unquote, a great resume without the dominance and skill factor. Canelo is a perfect example. He has all of these huge, big names on his resume. But every time he... Really? Canelo Alvarez has all these huge and big names on his resume. Did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Did you hear that? Dante's Boxing Nation, you know... This dude, overall, Canelo Alvarez, you know, has apparently overall been ducking and avoiding all these guys, and he hasn't been facing challenges. All of a sudden, the truth comes out. All of a sudden, the fat bastard comes out with the truth. Fought the biggest and toughest challenges. He either lost to them or he won by controversy. No, he didn't lose to them. Canelo Alvarez has only lost twice in his career, and this is why Dante's boxing nation gets on my nerves. Um, it just is what it is. Uh, Canelo Alvarez was able to beat Danny Jacobs. There was no controversy. He was able to beat Callum Smith and Billy Joe Saunders and Caleb Plant without any controversy. The only two fights overall that were really controversial overall were the first Gennady Golovkin fight and the Adesani Laura fight. But once again, it's so particularly interesting because uh, there's other fights on the know that were very, very big in other fighters' careers, but that were allegedly controversial to a lot of people. You know, like when you talk about <laughs> when you talk about overall Andre Ward beating Sergey Kovalev, would would Dante's boxing nation claim, oh well, you know what, we can't even count that because a lot of people truly thought that Sergey Kovalev could have won, and it really was a fight that could have went either way. So we really can't even count that as a big win. Of course, he wouldn't say that. It's idiotic. Floyd Mayweather, he lost to him. Edison Lara fight and the first two Golovkin fights when Golovkin was younger. All of those fights ended in controversy. No, they didn't really end in controversy. The first era, the Arasani Laura fight, very, very tough fight. You can really debate that that fight could have went either way. You also could debate that Arasani Laura could have potentially been a little bit more offensive in that fight. Either way, if you take a look at it from a logical and sound mind, Arasani Laura, when it came down to it, he could have potentially won the fight, but you could very clearly argue that Canelo deserved it as well. The first fight against Gennady Golovkin, that probably was the worst decision in Canelo Alvarez's career. But the second fight overall, when it comes down to it, no, Canelo Alvarez, he deserved that fight. So come on, Dante, stop stop your bullshit. So having all those big names, it doesn't really mean a whole lot if you did not dominate the opponents. Once again, I'm Really? So all of a sudden we're going by how dominant overall certain opponents are, even in 50-50 fights. So what that means all of a sudden is that certain fighters on the know that formerly were all-time great fighters, they no longer can be remembered as all-time great fighters or as high as what they are because in the biggest fights of their career, they were not dominant. Does that truly make any sense? So Sugar Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns because he heavily struggled. All, the, all of a sudden, Sugar Ray Leonard can't be counted as the best of his generation or the Tommy Hearns fight just doesn't count or the Marvin Hagler or the Roberto Duran fights. All of a sudden, that doesn't count. Does that make any sense? <laughs> does Does that make any sense? You see how dumb this dude is? Like, that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That doesn't make any sense. All of a sudden, Manny Pacquiao against Marquez. All of a sudden, those fights still don't count. So I guess that means that the Eric Morales and Marco Antonio Barrera trilogy, you can just basically count out those wins because you can just cross them off because they were overall too competitive. Does that make any damn sense? <laughs> anyway. I want to keep saying it. This is the reason why there are many factors that determines if someone is pound for pound number one or even top ten, one of the best in the world. You cannot have resume without skill or dominance, just like you cannot have... No, actually, you can. At least overall, it can be a lower version of skill. Because of Deontay Wilder, for example, who I don't believe is necessarily an A-grade level skilled fighter, if he ends up overall, you know, uh, saying, let's say beating Anthony Joshua, Alexander Usyk, but doesn't beat Tyson Fury, all of a sudden he can debatably be on the top 10 pound for pound list. And that's why on my list, dominance and skill set, they're a little bit lower on my list. Because once again, if you take a look at George Foreman, George Foreman was one of the most dominant heavyweights and one of the most dominant fighters in history. Not just in heavyweight history, but in boxing history. 
he, in my opinion, was not necessarily someone that was ever going to be a Muhammad Ali or a Mike Tyson in terms of skill set, or a Tyson Fury, for that matter, if you want to put him in that same conversation as well. But when it came overall to dominance, he was up there with anybody. That's why overall resume is the most important category. Yes, you can be a top 10 pound per pound fighter if you don't necessarily have an A-grade skill set, but you have to win the biggest fights of your career. And dominance without any big wins or names on your resume. And that's why Jerron Ennis is not on the pound for pound list right now. Because well, when on certain LDBC channels, he is. So I'll, I'll give you that, Dante. Anyway comes to dominance when it comes to skill set when it comes to taking risk we could check all of those boxes for jerron <clears throat> but we cannot check the resume box yet we'll talk a little bit more about that on other videos but for now i'm gonna close out by giving my thoughts on sugar ray robinson dissing muhammad ali as many interviews and documentaries that i've seen of muhammad ali i've never heard that story i found it amazing that sugar ray robinson would do someone like that I mean, it's already bad to do that to anyone. I really don't find it very surprising at all uh, when it comes down to it. Once again, uh, if you've seen overall certain older fighters, uh, you know, if you watch a lot of interviews of Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali, there's an interview overall where Joe Lewis, more than likely because he felt that Muhammad Ali was his replacement, overall he basically said that he believed that if he fought Muhammad Ali, he would have been one of the bums of the month. He would have been a part of of the bum of the month club. So it's not really over anything new in my opinion. And <laughs> from what I've heard of Sugar Ray Robinson overall, when it came down to it at times, he wasn't always the most, uh, you know, nice dude, at least from what I've heard. But anyway. It's already bad to do that to someone who eventually becomes a champion. But he did it to someone who became the biggest iconic figure in the sport of boxing. I mean, I can understand Sugar Ray Robinson being busy and telling Muhammad Ali, look, man, I don't have no time to train you. But the least he could have did was sign his autograph. That's all I got for now, guys. I'm on to the next one. Let me tell you guys about... But anyways, that's really about it for today. I just thought that that was very particularly interesting. But anyways, <laughs> that's really about it overall for today. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. And we'll see overall what happens with boxing next year as it could be a very particularly interesting year. But anyways, that's really about it for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll talk to you all later.